All right, well, good morning. <clears throat> a lot of new faces that are unfamiliar to me, but a lot of, a lot of also faces that are very familiar returning back over this weekend. It's good to see you. Well, clearly we're in Psalm 100, which is where we're going to start today. This is the song of a thankful people. There's a n- number of different titles, certainly you could title it to. That's the one we're using today, and you'll see why. But as we begin, if you've heard of Jonathan Edwards, which I'm sure you have uh, from Eric's preaching, no less, if you've heard of his writings such as Religious Affections, which is one of his books, one of his greatest books, and if you've read anything from it, I would encourage you to do so again, and if you've never have, you should do it. The point of that being when he starts his thesis into a term that might be a little bit unfamiliar, religious affections. When he starts his thesis of what true religion looks like in the life of the believer, and he calls this religious affections, holy affections interchangeably, he defines what's meant by affections from the start. And in short, and this is where we're going to begin, our souls have in a sense, two fundamental faculties or powers to them in in that the first is the understanding, the faculty by which we perceive something, we discern something, we view something, we judge something. It tells you what something is. But the second is the will. It's that which you dislike something or you may like something, you love something, hate something, reject something, approve something, and that's how you perceive it based on your understanding. And so, some inclinations would be mild. They would barely register at all, like choosing to wear a tie or not to wear a tie this morning. Others may be more persistent, more lively as far as your choosing it, such as me choosing to marry that woman over there. (laughs) The latter, the more intense, the more vigorous, persistent, as Edwards calls it, that would be what we'd call the affections. Vigorous, sensible exercises of the will. The point of this, and the point of what Edwards is getting at, is that the affections are often the spring of men's actions. Because without lively affections, few of us would do much of anything. What animates our actions is love and hate, fear, desires, griefs, joys. Affections reveal the fundamental orientation of your heart. And so, when you see what a person loves or hates or fears or desires, rejoices in, grieves over, you're seeing the bent and the tendency of their heart. And I think the reason Edwards took such pains to define this is because he truly wanted us to grasp that if we want to know what kind of heart we have, we have to look at our affections. And like most of the Psalms, Psalm 100, this was a psalm that was sung in the temple worship. This was during lively times of national feasts, national festivals. What's interesting about Psalm 100 as we start is that it's addressed to the gathered assembly. So the psalmist, as it were, today is addressing all of us together as a group. Spurgeon writes of Psalm 100, nothing can be more sublime this side of heaven than the singing of this noble psalm by a vast congregation. It is all ablaze, he says with grateful adoration. I would hope that in light of (laughs) Spurgeon's words, we would hope that some of the sparks from Psalm 100 would fall on us today. That our affections would be captured as we turn our attention here. That it would capture our affections and mold our lives. It would inform our passion, our practice each and every Sunday. And that this Psalm would renew us with grateful adoration for the greatness and the goodness and the grace of God. So, With all that being said, let's turn to Psalm 100 if you're not already there. Some of your Bibles may have a heading that says, A Psalm for Giving Thanks. This is what we read. Make a loud shout to Yahweh all the earth. Serve Yahweh with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Know that Yahweh, He is God. It is He who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For Yahweh is good. His loving kindness endures forever and his faithfulness 
generation unto generation. Now, this is, I'm sure, a very familiar psalm to everybody. And there are certainly a lot of different ways that we could consider what's written here, and many have. For our purposes, there are really two main headings that I want us to draw our attention to, and then some more detailed observations along the way. But the first main heading is the active affections of a thankful people, if you're taking notes. The active affections of a thankful people. And we see this in verse 1, verse 2, and in verse 4. So this call to worship is clear, it's compelling, and it's present in a very pronounced way. This is a very brief passage. It's only five verses. Three of the five verses are invitations or imperatives. They are calls, they're commands to a certain activity in our worship. You see he says, make, serve, come, enter, give. I think that repetition alone in the first person should capture our attention. And then notice the particulars, the specificity of the heart and practice. You have to make and serve and come and enter and give to God in very specific ways. So we ought to give attention to those kind of specifics that are present here, these active affections of a thankful people. So what do we see starting in verse 1? Make a loud shout to Yahweh. And then it extends to all the earth. And then a little bit further in verse 1, come before him with joyful songs. So noisy, joyful singing. The NIV, if you have that, says shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. If you have the ESV, make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Shout joyfully to the Lord all the earth. If you're the New American Standard, the call to worship is a noisy call. That's the point. It's loud. It's loud. Now, at the outset, this is not the only psalm that addresses the appropriate practice in corporate worship. It's not exhaustive, but this psalm and the points that we're going to look at from this psalm, they're, going, they're, they're pronounced in and throughout the psalms. It's not just here. And so I think it's appropriate, it's more appropriate, it's commanded that when the church gathers, there's certain distinctives. And right here from the start, make a joyful noise. There's a distinctive there. In the Word Bible Commentary, Marvin Tate writes, the enthusiasm of Israelite worship is illustrated through Psalms 93 through Psalms 100. Listen to what he says. Shouts are raised, praise is chanted and sung, musical instruments are played, and horns blown. He says the noise of the temple worship was legendary. So, Psalms 93 through 100 Let's look at a couple of those. Psalm 95. You don't have to turn there. You can listen along or if you want to turn, but nine, Psalm 95, 1 through 2. O come, let us sing to, for joy to Yahweh. Let us make a what? Loud shout to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a loud shout to him with songs of praise. One psalm over, Psalm 96. Starting verse 11, let the heavens be glad, let the earth rejoice, let the sea roar as well as its fullness, let the field exult and all that is in it, let all the trees of the forest, or then all the trees of the forest will sing for joy before Yahweh. Then if you go over to Psalm 98, just one more, starting verse 4, make a loud shout to Yahweh, all the earth, Break forth and sing for joy and sing praises. Sing praises to Yahweh with the lyre, with the lyre and sound of singing, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. Make a loud shout before King Yahweh. That's cool. That's loud. <laughs> the noise, the volume present there. The, the noise from the instruments, the horns you see here, the lyre, the, the noise from the voices, the noise that characterizes the celebration, the worship of God. Notice that this is not someone's self-determined preference. When we obey a command like this, it's because we're being informed by this psalm and numerous other psalms as well. So when we say... <laughs> That part of the call to worship here is this no noisy, joyful singing. This isn't a fellowship church distinctive. This is a biblical distinctive. We're encountering a command here in the psalmist's call to worship God. It's about his pleasure anyway. 
It's about his glory. It's about our edification and our good as well. But while it's noisy, it's distinctively joyful noise. So it's not just loud. It's not just about volume. It's not just about decibel level. It's distinctively joyful noise. James Montgomery Boyce writes of this verse, the people of God are to praise God loudly because they're happy with him. Yes, yes. Volume alone is not sufficient to please God. Volume alone is not sufficient to glorify God. By the way, neither is skill alone on the part of the musicians sufficient to glorify God. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. We're grateful for the skill of musicians who serve us, like was demonstrated this morning. So we're not minimizing the importance of skill. In fact, it'd be a distraction if they weren't skillful. There's something to be said about undistracting excellence. That's for another time. So we're grateful for the time, the energy, the arrangement that's put in to serve us in such a way like was done this morning, something that's characterized by skill, pleasing, glorifying God as they play skillfully, they sing skillfully. So I'm not minimizing the importance of skill, but I'm emphasizing that mere volume alone or skill alone is not sufficient to glorify God because this is qualified. The psalmist qualifies it. Make a joyful noise, not just a noise. So skill, volume, it's important, but it's not sufficient. The noise has to have a distinctive sound to it, and the distinctive sound is joy. And in the midst of all the happy noise, the joy has to be clearly discernible. And that's really one of the things I appreciate most about those who serve every week when we sing on Sundays. It's the joy in which they serve us, the joy in which they play, the joy in which they sing. They do well, I think, in modeling joy for us. And I have to say this because it's his last Sunday here, but Eric Hansen is like one of the most happy, happiest looking people I know. He's always smiling. He's always smiling when he's playing bass. Well, most of the time. Sometimes you're focusing real hard. But the point is that these are not professional performers. They're leading, serving by their distinct example of joy when they play and when they sing skillfully. And they're helping and leading us to do the same. And so even, even as each of them is you know, concentrating to differing degrees, depending on their role in that moment, their skill, there's joy present. They're engaged. They're performing. They're, they're, they're not performing. They're serving. They're, they're personally affected, uh, is what I'm trying to say, by what's happening. And again, it's the joy that's distinctive about what they're doing. And that helps us as we sing for joy to be distinctive about the noise we're making when we sing. So again, from Spurgeon, he writes, Our happy God should be worshipped by a happy people. Yes. <laughs> yes. Listen, by God's grace, our desire ought to be that we or anyone else who walks through those front doors is able to discern the presence of joy here, right? And I think that they do because often I do hear those kinds of comments, those kinds of statements. But we want a desire for there to be such a happiness, such a joy, that even if the style of music is not always to, to everyone's preferred genre or Maybe sometimes the volume does get a little bit higher than someone's personal preference. I think what is clearly discerned and what affects us most is the joy that's present, the happiness that's present as we glorify and please God together in our songs. And it's going to be noisy. I mean, we're singing. Because we should be, by the grace of God, the happiest people on earth. I mean, do you realize what we just sang earlier? On that cross where Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied, for every sin on him was laid. I'm just saying, when we sing songs like that, we realize that we've received the person and finished work of Christ. We recognize the sin-bearing Savior, absorbed the wrath that a wretched sinner like me deserved. I'm just saying, thinking about that, and singing about that should probably be done loudly and happily. I mean, I can't help thinking that if we're not, maybe we don't get it. I don't know how to say that calmly, let alone sing it calmly. I mean, yeah, God totally satisfied 
or Christ wholly satisfied God's wrath. It's great. It's great. It's awesome. No, that's to register something. <laughs> he completely absorbed and satisfied and drained the cup of wrath dry, leaving not a drop for you or for me to drink. We should be happy people. Now, I know that that can make some people uncomfortable a little bit. I know probably some of you are thinking, I am not like you. People like you just kind of come out loud, it seems. <laughs> and I think if you've spent any time with any of our kids, you'll know that to be true of them as well. If you know my mom, I'm sure she's got stories she could tell you. I, I get that I've kind of been somewhat loud from the get-go. But what my point in saying that is that I'm not trying to impose my personality on you in any way or my preference on you. God has designed so many people who are very quiet. And I've met people who are incomprehensibly quiet to me, who are as passionate, if not more, than I am about the gospel. And that starts with that woman that's sitting right there, the second row to my left, who I've been married to for 12 years. And, you know, what appears to be true probably for most couples, we're different in quite a few ways. You don't need any world-class discernment to observe those ways. But my wife is pretty quiet, I think, compared to me. She's very thoughtful. She is no less fervent in her affections toward Christ. The only difference might be in how we express that fervency. And so maybe if you're more like Jessica, you're more on the quiet side. You find people like me a little bit odd and unappealing. <laughs> Don't misunderstand. I'm not trying to communicate anything other than what the Bible is saying to both of us today. And I would add, kind of like I mentioned before, the inherent action of singing is just noisy anyway. And from what I heard, nobody was lip syncing today. I don't think anyone was humming today. I, there definitely wasn't any whistling today. But if you are someone that's more on the quiet side, but you were singing today, you're one of the noisy ones too. Okay, without question, there's, there's much the Psalms have to say about silence, about meditation. That's not Psalm 100. That's a sermon for another time. The point today is that we simply cannot excuse ourselves from appropriately responding to this Psalm simply because we may have different personalities, different preferences. We have to be clear when we talk about the worship of God from the opening pages of Genesis to the end of Revelation, the worship of God is never according to our preferences. Never. Any study of the Old Testament worship and all the prescriptions of how the people of God had to approach God should give you some sort of clue to that, for sure. It's a command from God as a means of glorifying Him and edifying one another. So it's noisy. It's joyful noise. And it obviously involves singing. So we come into His presence with singing, verse 2. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into His presence with singing. Derek Kidner, in his commentary, he says, where God rules and where God is, there is singing. I love that. And verse 2 kind of gives an abbreviated answer to questions like, well, why do we sing? I mean, why were we singing this morning? And why do we sing so much? <laughs> why do we sing so long? Well, singing to God and singing to each other about God, it's a command. It's a sweet gift of grace. We make singing a priority in our worship of God. Listen to what two stalwarts of the faith have said about this. Martin Luther, I'm sure we're familiar with him. Music is to be praised second only to the Word of God because by her, all the emotions are swayed. That is why there are so many songs and psalms. This precious gift has been bestowed on men alone to remind them that they are created to praise and magnify the Lord. Jonathan Edwards, the duty of singing praises to God seems to be given wholly to excite and express religious affections. He says, there is no other reason why we should express ourselves to God in verse rather than in prose and with music, except that these things have a tendency to move our affections. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. 
And that's exactly what's at work here in the Psalms. The, the Psalms really as a whole are in effect demanding as, as Piper, John Piper would, like, would put it, poetry being stretched into song. And so when God commands the gathered church, as is our case, to respond to the call of worship, we respond by singing noisily gospel-centered, theologically informed poetry so that our affections might be stirred and so that we might respond more so appropriately and joyfully and gratefully to God. So noisy, joyful singing. Verse 2, we also see glad service. And we're going to look at these other two imperatives under this first heading a little bit more briefly, but the glad service to Yahweh in verse 2. Again, John Piper would define this as true worship is based on a right understanding of God's nature and it is rightly valuing God's worth. And so that's important because this is visible in two basic ways in the New Testament. One is acts of the mouth through praise, repentance, and the other is acts of love with the body and the hands and the feet, things that show the supreme value of God by what we're willing to do on his behalf to sacrifice, perhaps, for the good of others, even at the expense of our own comfort. Hebrews chapter 13, starting at verse 15, says, Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that confess his name. And do not neglect doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Notice at the beginning of those two verses, if you take them together, it starts and ends with sacrifice. That's an echo, in a sense, to the old covenant sacrifices that were so much at the center of Israel's worship. But now through the redemption that's come to us through Jesus Christ, those two things become worshipful sacrifices in our life. The fruit of lips that acknowledge His name Worship services like we're having today that involve singing, that involve prayer, that involve repentance, that involve confession of sin, and the fruit of deeds, not neglecting to do good, sharing with one another what we have. The qualifier there is the gladness. Serve the Lord with gladness. Robert Hawker, right, he, he has this commentary I, I love. It's called The Poor Man's Commentary. And on this passage, he writes, no service can be real that is not free and performed with gladness. Think, my soul, with what freeness and gladness of heart thy Jesus entered upon his service when he called out at the call of the Father, lo, I come, I delight to do thy will, O my God. My soul, what sayest thou, Hawker writes, what sayest thou to this view of thy Savior, Oh, how precious to behold him everywhere and in all things. So serving gladly or glad service. Thirdly, this is the other imperative under this heading of actionable or active affections. But this, <clears throat> excuse me, this imperative involves giving thanks and involves giving praise. We see that in verse 4. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. I'm looking forward to doing just that at the conclusion of our gathering today so we can apply Psalm 100. Verse 4, enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. I'm sure we know that verse so well. Give thanks to him, bless his name. This is the appropriate response to a call to worship, isn't it? Thanksgiving to God for what he's done. Praise to God for who he is. We're joyful because we're grateful for who he is and what he's done for us. And so when we gather, we bless his name. That's what we do. And that's what we all do together when we gather. Now, this quote from Richard Wells, it's this lovely little book, Forgotten Psalms, and I'd encourage anyone to read this. It's an interesting thing to consider as we move to this second heading because he says the strong emotions of the Psalms make many people uncomfortable many modern people uncomfortable, which is ironic since our culture seems to feed on feelings. It's very true. There are a lot of reasons why we might be uncomfortable with the strong emotions and affections. I know we're returning to that thought we had earlier. 
It could be the culture that we were raised in. It could be the family that we were raised in. It could be our personality. It could be our previous church experience. Regardless of those, those things, we have to be careful when we approach a psalm like this. We need to be attentive to any and every imperative that we find in the psalms. Whether that be the desperation like we heard when Eric preached from Psalm 6 a number of weeks ago, where the psalmist says, I flood my couch with tears. My eye has wasted away with grief. There's such desperation there. Or on the other side, the noisy celebration that we see here in Psalm 100. We want to be familiar with the strong affections of the Psalms because the strong affections we encounter in the Psalms are theologically informed affections. Do you get that? We want to be familiar with them, comfortable with them. In fact, we want to do what we can to cultivate them because the Psalms don't merely describe the depth, the breadth of human emotion. The Psalms interpret human emotion. The Psalms inform human emotion with a God-centered perspective, and they prescribe a God-glorifying response every single time. And so the emotions or the affections that are present here, the joyful noise, the singing, the shouting, the serving with gladness, the offerings of thanksgiving and praise, those are theologically informed affections, which brings us to the second observation, the second heading. So we, first we had the active affections in verse 1, 2, and 4. The second heading would be verses 3 and 5. The rooted realities of a thankful people. If you're taking notes, the rooted realities of a thankful people. The psalmist is not just exhorting us to shout and sing and be loud and noisy and joyful just because he wants to. He doesn't do that without informing us the reasons why we shout, the reasons why we sing, why we are loud and noisy and joyful. He doesn't only call us to those activities. He gives us the why of those activities in our worship. In fact, anything that's been set up to this point really is meaningless without the realities that are present in verse 3 and 5. And we're going to see that together. There are very specific reasons for these strong affections and the loud expressions that we're commanded to communicate here. Because it's not simply sufficient for us to give attention to this call to worship God and the appropriate respect, uh, uh, expressions that are commanded here, it's not sufficient to do those things without being informed of the why, the reasons for worshiping God that are revealed right here in Psalm 100. Because it's possible for us this morning to try and fulfill those imperatives, the commands of this passage to sing and shout and serve and come and enter and give and bless it's, a poss it's possible for us to do that without the imperative that starts verse 3. Do you see that? Know. Know the reasons why. If we fulfill these commands, but we don't know the reasons why we are supposed to joyfully do these things, potentially it's meaningless. And even more so, potentially it's idolatrous. It's possible for us to participate today simply because we want to conform to everybody else. There's a good number of people in here, and probably most everyone is singing joyfully today, I'd assume, so I, I better do it too. That could potentially be meaningless and idolatrous. So remember where we started with Jonathan Edwards and what we considered, that affections reveal the fundamental orientation of the heart when you get further into his book, Edwards warns against trusting these external signs of affection that are unreliable. And so, for example, intensity is unreliable because on the one hand, it could be great. It can be good, evidenced by David. He's very intense in many of the Psalms that he writes. But on the other hand, people have all, all sorts of reasons to behave intensely about things that have nothing to do with Christ. True affections are the result of a saving work of the Spirit that gives us a new sense of the heart, a new foundation in our soul, a new ability to see the excellency of divine things, the beauty of God's holiness, for example. 
See, there's a difference between knowing that God's holy, the demons know that, and actually tasting the sweetness and the delight of God's holiness. It's a deeper knowledge that God gives us in the new birth. And that knowledge is essential for genuine religious affections. So note the rhythm as you go through this psalm. Verses 1 and 2, you have this call to worship, a call to give thanks. Then you go to verse 3, we encounter a reason, a rationale for giving thanks. You go to verse 4, again, there's a second call to worship, to give thanks. And then in verse 5, there's further reasons to give thanks, further rationales. By the way, if you're a song leader or aspiring song leader, you want to take note. This is how the psalmist gets it done. This is really how we should get it done too. The why of the worship informs the how of the worship. And the why of worship ultimately is more important than the how of worship. Experiencing the strong affections that are evident in this psalm, appropriately expressing the strong affections that are commanded in this psalm, is the effect of knowing God as revealed in this psalm. So it's no surprise when you get to verse 3, and he says, no that Yahweh, he is God. If it's, you have the ESV in front of you, know that the Lord, he is God. So in other words, you, can, you cannot appropriately come and enter and make and serve and shout and bless if you don't know the God who's wonderfully revealed here. Your knowledge of God must always precede your response to God. So our singing, our shouting, our thanksgiving, our praise, it has to be intelligent in the sense that it has to be informed. Affections are always the fruit or effect of what the mind understands and knows. We ought to know whom we worship and why we lift our voices in song. And so this morning, we would all acknowledge we are not worshiping an unknown God, right? We are worshiping the true and living God. So who is he? Who are we to know? The psalmist gives us two reasons for why we should worship. So happily, so eagerly, so noisily. And both of them are in his relationship to us. It's who he is and it's what he does. So who is he? Verse 3 says he's our creator. It is he who has made us. Our worship of God this morning and really throughout our lives, it starts here. He made us. True worship in spirit and truth. You remember Jesus spoke about this in John chapter 4. It's rooted in this distinction between creature and creator. And this is a fundamental reason why we worship and why it's in the way prescribed here by the psalmist. He made us so he owns us that we might have relationship with him, to delight in him, to worship him. This is the purpose of creation, is to glorify him. And so how tragically, because of sin, that we so often spurn this purpose, and we defy this God. We live as if we created ourselves. And the effects of rejecting the knowledge of God as creator, that's all around us. You think about it, the result of sin we live in a man-centered world where supposedly self-sufficient individuals imagine themselves to be self-made. They live for the purpose of self-exaltation and that impulse, that purpose, that ruled each and every one of us prior to conversion. And even still, that's the air that we breathe in the world all around us. Well, this, inver this verse informs us that God is creator and it's to remind us that our true purpose in being created by him to worship him. Knowledge of God as creator is essential. It is not optional. And when this knowledge of God as creator informs our lives, we recognize what? Our dependence on him. We recognize our need for him. The inherent difference between us, created beings, and him as creator. I think Sproul does such a great job of reminding us of this difference when he says, the grand difference between a human being and a supreme being is precisely this. Apart from God, I cannot exist. Apart from me, God does exist. God does not need me, 
in order for him to be. I do need God in order for me to be. I think the psalmist is very succinct as well. He made us. We don't gather to worship as people who are self-made. We don't gather as those who are self-sufficient. We are not to admire ourselves in our abilities, our achievements. We didn't even make ourselves. This is very humbling. Psalm 100 addresses this impulse to be preoccupied with ourselves, to be fascinated with ourselves, impressed by ourselves, rather than to be preoccupied with God, fascinated with God, impressed with God. He made us. It is He who has made us. And He made us to sing, to shout joyfully to Him, to serve Him with gladness, to give thanks to Him, to assign all glory to Him as our Creator while refusing the glory for ourselves. And it is only as we know Him as Creator and us as these dependent creatures that we can, in effect, discover this reason for our existence. Tom Skriner writes, Praising God is the goal of human life, the goal of every living thing, and the goal of all creation. That's what we're encountering here, where God is revealed as creator. But in addition to being creator, he's our redeemer. So continue on in that verse, verse 3. Know that the Lord, know Yahweh, he is God. It is he who has made us, and not we ourselves... We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. We are his people. That knowledge of that statement, understanding that statement, adds an incredible intimacy to our relationship to who, uh, to who God is towards us. So, step back. How does this inform our affections toward God? We have to ask ourselves... In light of the problem of sin, man's rejection of him creator, how does that statement, we are his people, even happen? How do we become his people? How do we become the sheep of his pasture? There is only one explanation. And honestly, you can't read these verses without thinking of whom they're foreshadowing, right? Or even hearing Jesus as he says this in John 10. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. I know my own, and my own know me. A little further down, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. This should leave us amazed perplexed even, with strong affections. We didn't create ourselves, for He made us, and we didn't redeem ourselves, for He redeemed us through the sending and sacrificing of His Son to make us His people. Remember what Peter says, chapter 2, verse 10, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy mercy. So the only explanation for what we read here, we are his people and we're the sheep of his pasture. The only explanation is the grace and mercy of God. The only explanation is that the good shepherd laid down his life for his sheep. The only explanation is that sinners like you and I received indescribable mercy and grace of the Father. The only explanation for what we read here is that we've been liberated from the bondage of sin, ransomed by the redemptive work of Christ, something entirely impossible for any of us to achieve. And that is cause for much praise. That is cause for strong emotions. Remember what we just read in verse 1, that this invitation of grace, who is it, who is this call to worship to? All the earth. Make a joyful noise, all the earth. The psalmist directs his attention to all the earth at the start. So that's every single person in this room. And so the only question left unanswered beyond that would be, 
whether each and every person in this room has responded to this invitation. Have you responded to the invitation to humble yourself, acknowledging you are not self-made? You are not self-sufficient. Have you responded to the invitation to repent of your self-exaltation, your self-glorification? Have you responded to the invitation to recognize you have offended the God who created you, the one who owns you, the one to whom you are accountable, to whom you must answer on the last day? Have you responded to this invitation to acknowledge your need for the Savior and the Redeemer who received upon a bloodied body, His bloodied body at the cross, the wrath that was justly deserved for us? Have you responded to the invitation to find forgiveness for your sins through Him, that you might enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise, filled with strong affections that have been informed by the person and work of Christ? If you've not responded to that invitation, today is when you should do that. Today is the day. But you know, we're not always happy. We're not always joyful. Sometimes it's hard to come to this passage, and even though we know these things to be true about God and what He's done, sometimes it's hard to come to Psalm 100 and read, make a joyful noise to the Lord. We are not always happy. We're not always joyful. There are seasons of suffering that are so painful, it stops our singing for a time. And time has to pass. And I think of Psalm 137 that illustrates this really well. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat and also wept when we remembered Zion. Our captors asked us about the words of a song and our tormentors asked joyfully saying, sing for us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing a song of Yahweh in a foreign land? There are seasons of suffering that can, actually singing can sustain us in affliction though. So you think about Paul and Silas when they were beaten with rods, they're thrown into prison in Acts 16. Luke tells us that they were singing, they were praying, they were singing these psalms of praise to God, and then the prisoners were listening to them. I bet if I polled every single person in this room, there's a song that comes to mind that touches you deeply in a special way that, that has sustained your faith at times, even powerfully, by what it says, right? It's important for us to also know that there's coming an eternal season, an eternal period of time, infinite period of time, when all suffering will cease. But you know what won't cease is singing. It's the worship of God. Revelation 5 says, They sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain and purchased for God with your blood people from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Psalm 100 is humbling to us in light of this creature-creator distinction. But it is liberating for us because the worship of God is not rooted in your emotions and your affections. If you're a Christian, how can you shout joyfully, sing noisily, serve gladly, if you don't presently feel strong affection? Because it's true. What Psalm 100 says about God is true. We have every reason to sing about the Creator and the Redeemer because it's true. He made you. And if you're a Christian, He redeemed you. That is true regardless of your present emotional state today. This psalm transcends how you feel at this and any moment. Singing has this way of affecting our emotions. That's why I try to use that word affections informing our affections or our emotions, stirring our affections so that, so that those emotions, those affections eventually conform to what we read here. It's right to desire these 
emotive type affections, but they have to be rooted in truth. They have to be rooted in what's real. Worship's formative. So the songs we sing, for instance, they are formative one way or the other. Uh, Kevin Twitt with uh, Indelible Grace, I love how he puts this. He says, when we're singing songs that make you feel like you have to put a happy face on to be part of the worship, we are lying about what the normal Christian life feels like. And that's why it's so important we sing songs that are anchored in bedrock. So how does Edward Moat's hymn go? You'll recognize it once I start reading it. I dare not trust the sweetest frame. So a frame is like an emotional state. We don't despise them, but we don't trust in them. So Edward Moat says, I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Each and every Sunday when we gather, just understand that there is, there is a meticulous intentionality about the content of our songs. We want to be coming on Sunday, humbling ourselves, acknowledging we're not self-made, we're not self-sufficient, we're not here for self-exaltation. No, you made us, God, we sing. You redeemed us, God, we sing. Every single one of us, I think, should anticipate and feel like we can't wait to get here on Sundays. Because regardless of how we feel upon arrival, this is what Sunday's about. It's gathering with the body, others who are amazed by the grace of God, fascinated by the grace of God, not here to impress others, but here to do these things. Make, serve, come, enter, bless, give something so liberating here. And I really hope that this could be comfort to anyone here who came sorrowful, came discouraged, broken, angry, confused, sorrowful, and lukewarm and weary. This psalm and psalms like it, it can make all the difference in the midst of trial and suffering. Because I mean, if you think about it to differing degrees, we are all coming here in this lifelong death batch with sin, experiencing some form of trial. All of us, we all arrive with that in common to some extent. It should be liberating to know that our worship of God is not rooted in our circumstances. And I am not in any way trying to minimize the painfulness that anyone who is suffering today is feeling. But this is good news for us. Our worship of God today is not rooted in how we feel. He made us is true, regardless of the severity of suffering you may be experiencing today. And better news than that, we are His people. We are the sheep of His pasture. Again from Robert Hawker, he says, Observe the motives and the encouragement to this cheerful service. Our God is God, and He is a good God, and He is our God as our Creator and we are his by right of creation like sheep that have an owner. And being his property, shall we not be his care? Yes, for he is good. Sweet thought. Both by creation and by redemption, we are his. And therefore he hath an undoubted right to all our services. And well may we give him the tribute of praise. So that first reality, who he is, and we're going to very briefly, the second reality that anchors us, roots us, this rooted reality, is what he does. And that's what you see in verse 5. The Lord is good. Simply put, this is the character of God. The Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. His faithfulness to all generations. We could spend the rest of our lives pondering every single one of those realities. We have to be brief here, though, and we have to bring this to an end. This verse, to close Psalm 100, this is why we enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. God is good. God is love. God is faithful. And frankly, that should overwhelm us. And we are the more certain of his goodness and love and faithfulness because of the cross. With New Testament eyes, this, this kind of triune character assessment of God, His goodness, His love, His faithfulness, it points us back to verse 4, really. Because look, at, look back at verse 4. 
Notice the unlikely nature of the invitation to come and worship. I've quoted from Derek Kidner, he again, here, he says, the simplicity of this invitation in verse 4, enters gates with thanksgiving, his courtyards with praise. He says, the simplicity may conceal the wonder of it. What's the wonder? The courts are truly his, they're not ours. And the gates are shut to the unclean. So Kidner goes on and he references Revelation 21. It's talking of the heavenly city where John writes, Nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So the simplicity, he says, of this invitation may conceal the wonder of it because the courts are truly his, not ours, and his gates are shut to the unclean, yet not only his outer courts but the Holy of Holies itself are thrown open by a new and living way, and we are welcome. This in itself is cause enough for praise. Yes, it is. Cause enough for praise because this invitation anticipates, this invitation to enter his gates, it anticipates what's to come, how Christ is going to make that new and living way. It anticipates what Hebrews 10 writes. Every priest stands daily ministering, offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins, but he, having offered one sacrifice for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, for by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Therefore, brothers... Since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. That is such good news. So we're, cl we're closing now, I promise. So two, two brief thoughts. First, theology leads to doxology. There's an entire way of life in the way this psalm is structured. So you, you, verse, verses 1 and 2, the joy, the gladness, giving rise to singing, it's joyful actions. Verse 3, you're called to know something. You're called to know something. Know what is true. Verses, or verse 4, we return to the theme of the first two verses, emphasizing thanksgiving, praise, blessing. Again, joyful actions. And then in verse 5, 4, that word literally is because. So the foundation of joy and gladness is what is true about God. So what we, when we learn we know glorious truths about God, there's to be this outflowing of action that expresses our affections towards God. So... Because I know the Father chose me from the foundation of the world, I'm going to make a joyful noise to him. Because I know Jesus is a good master, I serve him with gladness. Because I know he has made a new and living way through his son, I come into his presence with a song. Because I know the Lord's purposes for me are always good, I enter his gates with thanksgiving. Because I know his love never ceases and surpasses all understanding, I will praise him in his courts. And because I know his faithfulness never fails me, even amidst my unfaithfulness, by the way, I will bless his name. So theology leads to doxology. And then secondly, this is Advent season. It's a wonderful time for us to uniquely rejoice in these realities cultivating these affections. We're going to close in singing in just a moment, a little bit revised version of Away in the Manger that I think uniquely informs and directs those affections to the Messiah. So just for example, verse 2, Away in a manger a servant is born, made nothing to raise up the hopeless and poor, with grace as his burden and love as his yoke, the gentle Lord Jesus will shepherd our souls. May the richness of truth like that about God and everything we find here in the Word of God, may that stir us to cultivate these holy religious affections, friends. 
Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are thankful this morning. So thankful. This is a song for thankful people, and that is who we are today, I pray. We are thankful for what your word reveals to us and tells us about who you are and what you have done, that we might come and enter and sing and shout and serve and give and bless and praise you. Many of us, I'm sure, have spent much time thanking you over the past few days. But as John prayed, it is not a season to move beyond. May we always be thanksgiving people. May we always be people who are wanting, desiring to give you thanks for who you are and what you have done. And may we do so noisily at times even. May we do so serving with glad and happy hearts. And Lord, help us to help us to really almost crawl into the reality that we these things are true regardless of how we feel. And Lord, when suffering and trial comes and pain and sorrow comes, these things remain true. And Lord, we can only rely on you to give us the strength and your faithfulness, the strength that we need to still yet bless your name. So Lord, I don't know who those people are in this room today, but I'm sure there are some. Would you touch them today? Would your spirit work in their hearts? Would there be people in our church that would put an arm around them before they leave today? Let them know how much we care for them and we love them. Lord, this is all part of being the family of God. This is all part of worshiping you in this lifelong pursuit of you. And so to that end, we pray. Amen.